Good evening, councillors. Would you please remain standing while the Reverend Dr. Daniel Eshun leads the council in prayer? God of faith, God of love, and God of hope, we pray that as we start our deliberation, may you give us faith in one another the trust to listen and the love to pursue the common good. God of hope, may you give us the hope for our borough and for all the challenges that we face. May we trust in you. We ask this in your name now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, one more. <laughs> Thank you. Apologies for absence have been received from Councillor Gibbons. Are there any other apologies? No, thank you. Item one. The minutes of the meeting held on the 17th of July 2019 have been circulated. Can I sign these minutes as a correct record? Thank you. Item two, my announcements. On tonight's agenda, can members please note that paragraph 12 of report number two and items 19, 20, 21 and 22 are required to be considered as a matter of urgency. The reasons are set out in full at the top of that item. I would like to remind members when speaking that the amber light comes on with 90 seconds to go and the red light comes on 30 seconds before the end of their speech. May I also remind members that in relation to adjournment debates, the one hour period to the next adjournment motion begins when the motion is made, i.e. moved and seconded, not at the end of the adjournment motion response or vote. On item three, before I invite members to declare any interest, there are four motions on tonight's agenda. All members would have received an email this afternoon from the Head of Governance giving advice on declarations of interest. Are there any members who have any declarations of interest in any of the matters to be considered at this meeting? No, thank you. Item four relates to sealing of documents. Is this the item received as information? Read, read, thank you. On item five, are there any petitions? Uh, Madam Mayor, sorry to interrupt you. Be, before we went further, uh, might I, under section 28, uh, ask your permission to move uh, either now or at a time of uh, appropriate time of your choosing uh, uh, a motion to adjourn the council for one minute on a matter of importance to local democracy? Are you doing it now? I, I, I was, certainly can, yes. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Councillor Ryder. Thank Councillor you. Ryder, continue. Uh, I, I just wanted to speak briefly in this adjournment to highlight a matter I think of great importance to local democracy, that uh, the Mayor of London's decision to call in the, uh, the uh, decision by Wandworth Council's planning committee to uh, reject the Osiers Rose scheme, which was opposed by literally hundreds of local residents. Um, as members will probably know, it involves blocks of up to 14 storeys, which will be, in some cases, just seven metres away from other buildings. And in one case, will gravely affect the daylight to 68% of the windows in one block. I think it's a great negation of local democracy for the mayor to call this in. And the Labour group on the planning committee um, uh, back the rejection of this, and I hope their, their planning spokesman might join me in urging the Mayor not to overturn the Council's decision. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Um, thank you, Councillor Ryder. Um, I, understand, I understand the reason why you want to adjourn the Council. Clearly, this is an application for development in your ward, 
uh, one that um, I, I understand from talking to you and your ward colleagues. Uh, there was a considerable opposition uh, to it. Um, the scheme has been amended on several occasions before it went to committee, but it failed to uh, get the support of the committee. Uh, and I entirely understand uh, that the support uh, or the vote against the scheme was unanimous. I think there was no political division uh, in, in, in the way the, the matter was decided. So, uh, so those things are important and I understand, I understand entirely why you want to join the council to draw attention to the democratic deficit in an area of uh, great interest and great importance to members uh, of your residents in your ward. Madam Mayor, uh, just, just taking it slightly wider than that, and of course the Mayor's interest in, in planning is an issue which concerns us and concerns all London boroughs in that, that uh, London boroughs feel, and Wandsworth has always felt, that we are best placed to make judgments on planning matters uh, because we are the ones who are closest to the planning decisions and the concerns of local residents and the needs of our communities. And therefore, we are best placed to do it and, and we are best, we should, should, should make that decision. It's interesting that in the 16 years prior to this mayor, there has been probably two or three call-ins over 16 years of planning decisions of this council, which is a remarkable record given that uh, you know, we have had an enormous amount of development in the borough over those 16 years. That is because once the planning department is seen as a good, efficient, and ineffective department, and one that considers uh, planning decisions in the round, but also clearly and correctly. And so, of course, the mayor's intervention here is seen locally as both uh, unhelpful and partisan and perhaps also doctrinaire. So I understand entirely this, but um, um, may I also say that given uh, Council Ryder is talking to, about adjourning for a minute, that perhaps uh, I would acquiesce in his ask and uh, say that just for that very brief moment, this council should show its uh, displeasure at Mayor's action. So does Councillor Ryder wish to... Point of order, uh, Madam Chair. Um, is it in order for members of the Plain Applications Committee to vote on this because uh, they act in a quasi judicial role and it might be seen if they voted either way. I'll take, I'll take, I'll take advice of the Chief so, Executive. So, so first ask Councillor Ryder whether he uh, yeah. is content and whether he wishes to uh, withdraw the agenda. Are you content with the Leader's reply and would you like to withdraw your motion now you've heard that? No, I'm content, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Then in that case we don't have to go to a vote, thank you. Right, I didn't expect that. Right, thank you. Right. Where were we? <laughs> Get to where we were. So we're now at item five, item five petitions. petitions. Are there any petitions? Item five, Councillor Grimston. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have two petitions. One from residents of Hindhead Point Tower Block, 16 residents, uh, pleading the council not to impose sprinklers on. Councillor Angela Graham. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I've got two petitions, one from Kimber Road, Twilly, Lytton and Esparto and um, Firmage, requesting that a contraflow is removed. And the second one is from St John's Drive, residents asking that antisocial activities are investigated as soon as possible. Thank you. Councillor Stock. Councillor Oh, sorry. Councillor McDermott. Councillor McDermott. Councillor Forbes, I meant. Councillor McDermott. Councillor McDermott. Yes, sorry. Councillor McDermott. Thank you. A petition on behalf of residents of Noyner, Brenda and Langroyd Road for bike hangers. 
Thank you. Councillor Forbes, sorry, I'm getting the two <laughs> Kates mixed up, um, sorry. I've got a petition on behalf of residents of Franciscan Road um, requesting ones of council to survey traffic, uh, survey traffic conditions on and around Franciscan Road and to take further measures to improve road safety and air quality in the area. Thank you. Councillor Wintle. High Street Residents Association against the planning application for Golden Tours coming to Battersea. Thank you. Councillor Hart. Um, a petition on behalf of many residents of Nightingale asking for lots more trees. Okay. Councillor Henderson. Councillor Henderson. A petition on behalf of residents asking for the installation of Black Hanger near Petrie Avenue and French Court Road, signed by 52 people. Thank you. Council Councillor Anderson. I have a petition of 40 residents of Clyde House, which is 80% of the residents, complaining that they do not have any on-street parking and no underground parking, despite there being a big underground car park, because those spaces were sold to a neighbouring block, and feeling that's discrimination against them. Thank you. Councillor Cook. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I've got a uh, petition from residents of Eland Road uh, <laughs> requesting traffic survey and uh, consideration of measures to combat rat running. Councillor Dickerdam. Uh, I've got a petition from residents at Condell Road about the noises from the football pitches that are being hired outside their properties. Councillor McLeod. Hello, sorry, I've got two, two petitions. One from... Um, uh, sorry, one asking for the, uh, an activity centre on the Donington Estate to be reopened, and another one asking for general, more community space on, on, on Donington Estate. Thank you. Councillor Rigby. Councillor White. I've got four petitions, uh, three from Nightingale Square. Uh, one is asking for a long direct, another is asking for better security at Nightingale Square, and the other is asking for a soft play area. Uh, and the final one is for um, a petition for, uh, from the people we spoke to in the private rented sector looking for open-ended tenancies, landlord licensing and rent caps. Councillor Rigby. Um, a petition signed by 700 residents, businesses and users on Garrett Lane to reduce the speed to 20 miles an hour. Thank you. Any more petitions? Thank you. Each of the petitions will be referred to the executive or the appropriate committee or subcommittee. Item six is leaders' questions. Before we begin questions, may I remind all members that the overall period for members' questions to the leader and cabinet members is 45 minutes, with 20 minutes for leaders' questions and an action plan that um, will come to the Finance Corporate Resources Committee during the next cycle and, and, and the usual monitoring that will follow on a year-by-year -year basis in the future. I think it's also worth reflecting that the challenge we have set ourselves, and for that matter the Council's uh, machinery, is quite, quite a stiff challenge. And therefore, I think we should also be mindful that... Uh, <coughs> that task may not always be delivered to the satisfaction of each of us and, and many outside, because it is, it is just a big ask. The other thing also is that in this area, we are not experts. 
We are reliant on others to guide us, particularly in benchmarking, from where do we start to where do we need to get to kind of detail. That's not the core business of a local government. And in fact, there are very few out there whose core business it is, and very few out there who have definitive and reliable information on which to base our work. So there, we, there will be a bit of learning process. There will be a, a bit of a stumble on the way, and I ask members to show some forbearance. Just simply want to uh, touch on the Heathrow issues because, in fact, uh, our, 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 us and our partners go in front of the judges in the High Court tomorrow to, in fact, challenge the government's position on it. And just say that our view on Heathrow has been the same for now well over two and a half decades and remains, we remain as resolute as before and in fact the climate change emergency makes this case even stronger. We were pioneers in challenging the kind of side effects, the climatic and sort of quality of life side effects of Heathrow long before others and I, 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 I know that this council remains resolute in delivering that pledge. Uh, supplementary, Madam Mayor. Um, I'd just like to thank the leader for his um, detailed and positive reply and do welcome this progress on, you know, pr probably the biggest challenge that we face. Um, just wondering if he could say a bit more about um, the opportunity for all individual councillors to contribute um, the wide range of skills and experience that, uh, that they have for the next stage of this plan. Uh, and if I could just put forward a, a proposal that a more knowledgeable colleague asked me to say that the Committee on Climate Change has identified domestic heating as the most important area after transport to decarbonise. Uh, will the Council Action Plan consider the removal of fossil fuel boilers from our housing stock and replace them with solar or heat or other technology? Well, I thank Councillor Hogg for, for his supplementary. I mean, I suppose, you know, there will be people with expertise and, and um, I mean, I know, for example, Councillor Grimson has a, a particular expertise in, in matters of nuclear fuel, and undoubtedly nuclear fuel has a, has a contribution to make to, to giving us carbon neutral energy. And, 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 and his science, knowledge of science is far, far greater than anyone in this council, and it would be wrong not to, not to rely on it if, if the council was going down that road. So clearly I don't, I don't have a difficulty with people with genuine and proven expertise contributing to our solutions and, and so on. So, you know, but, but I would also be mindful that you know, when uh, I, quite a while back, when I set up a, not why my predecessor set up a little working party on how to control dogs, the number of contributions from my colleagues at that time on my side were way, way off beam because people have actually very clear hobby horses about things. So, not hobby horses, but genuine expertise, yes, happy to do that. Now, I just turn to the boilers issue. It's a question that one should ask oneself. I have a gas boiler, which was replaced about uh, three years ago. It was possibly at that time the most efficient uh, on the market. Um, we haven't recovered that investment yet, and that if I'm going to be asked to take it out, I think it would be quite an imposition uh, on, on, our fa on our personal budget. Now, if I am to make that decision, it's got to be done at my pace and in my ability to afford it. The same applies to the council. It's 17,000 stock uh, units in, in its own uh, management, and there are many others uh, in, in the leasehold management. All would have a considerable cost, and that cost would have to be somehow met. In the case of housing stock, it would be met by the tenants themselves because it comes out of the housing revenue account. So in a, in a sense, let's, let's accept that that is a challenge, but let us also not, in fact, build it up to an easy solution, because it is not that easy a solution. Actually, point of personal explanation, if I may, Mr. Mayor. Um, in the 30 or more <coughs> years in which I've uh, worked in the energy field, it's quite true that nuclear power has been my main focus, but I think the leader's characterization that that is the only area I've been involved uh, may lead to some rather peculiar uh, outcomes. For example, just two years ago, 
I published a 450-page book of which only two of the 11 chapters talked about nuclear at all. The other nine covered energy efficiency, they covered uh, the challenges around uh, renewables and, and a number of other issues. I'm disappointed, and I wonder if the leader in, in characterising me in this way, that until uh, a brief chat in the members' room before uh, the meeting today, I'd had not a single word from any member of the administration about this uh, particular discussion. He, the leader quite rightly says that the big wins out here are where we work on community issues, like Heathrow, the council's own... Yeah, yeah uh, I'll, I'll keep it brief, but it is a point of personal explanation I feel very strongly about. And I hope he's sincere about involving all of us and not just pigeonholing us in the way that I think he rather unfairly did uh, earlier and recognise that if we're going to make big differences, we have to be doing this on a community basis, right, not just you. on the council basis. Thank and those plans need to be made clear thank among all members thank as quickly thank as possible. You. Thank Madam, you, Madam Mayor, just let me just make it yeah. very clear. It's a great mistake to have named Councillor Grimston. I shall resist ever again uh, the temptation to do so. Yeah. So I think we have got a yes, question. Yes, we have Councillor Sutters. Councillor Sutters. Supplemental, thank you. Um, as some of you may know, I, I run my house on an air source heat pump, and I wonder whether the uh, leader would agree with me that the upfront investment in such technology is actually beyond quite a lot of people at the moment. It has not fallen to a level that allows most people to actually take this on seriously. And the upgrade also would involve changing much in within the house in order to accommodate um, such such technology, such as having a full house ventilation system, which some of our old properties are not capable of taking without an, an awfully intrusive uh, question, Councillor Sutters. So, thank Councillor Sutters for her supplementary. I mean, I think Councillor Sutters, in a sense, shows an example of expertise and knowledge uh, that it would be foolish for Council not to take into account. But she also makes it very clear, doesn't she, with her example, that technology is going to come to our aid in this challenge, meeting this challenge, but technology will come at some price, and not only some price to public authorities, but at some price to individuals. And so there is a great debate to be had as to where should that cost fall, whether it should fall on the individual purse or should it fall on the public purse to, to be given out as a subsidy. But the truth is that as technology comes in and it gets more and more used, prices do fall, out, fall uh, as a consequence. I mean, electric car charging points is a case in point. They were at one time a kind of rare thing. Now they are pretty, pretty easy to both install and given the number of cars, it makes a commercial sense to, in, in fact, install them. So technology will come to our aid, but and market will make sure that the price gets driven steadily lower to an affordable level. Councillor Hogg. Question number two to the leader. I thank Councillor Hogg for his uh, question. Um, Madam Mayor, can I say from the very beginning that this is a difficult area, isn't it? it, it you know, a, a death of a single person is a tragedy for, for, for his loved ones. Uh, it's a tragedy for the community in which it happens. Uh, and so I don't take, take that issue at all lightly. But also let's again put it into, in, into a kind of a measure. When we are talking about temporary accommodation, the image might be of something uh, uh, pretty ramshackly, but majority of the temporary accommodation this council uses is in borough or near borough. It is in fact in many cases just like any other house. In fact, people live there for as long as short, short hold tenancies are for. Uh, often the properties are part of our stock waiting, uh, waiting refurbishment and so we do a temporary refurb to, to house a temporary fam family for a temporary period. So they are not actually in any case, any way, second rate or second uh, rate properties. The other thing I'd say about, um, about the, the rough sleeper situation in the borough. Central London boroughs, of course, have the biggest uh, uh, problem. Boroughs with large uh, uh, railway termini have, have a considerable burden uh, about rough sleeping. But what I want to say is a, a big thank you to Spear Housing, who worked tirelessly in this borough, uh, providing both outreach and skilling up uh, rough sleepers in the borough, uh, so that not only are they looked after in terms of their housing and shelter needs, but they are given training and skills so that they can actually sustain that tenancy. Because one of the biggest, 
one of the biggest problems with, with uh, uh, rehoming, as it were, rough sleepers is their ability to sustain that tenancy uh, uh, for long enough a time. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, <laughs> supplementary. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, well, the situation is obviously appalling. 2,800 uh, children woke up homeless this morning in Wandsworth Council, temporary accommodation. Since I joined the council, the number of homeless families has gone up fivefold, 500%. Uh, and this deadly, deadly problem is only getting worse. Five or maybe seven people, we're not sure, died sleeping rough on our streets last year. Thank you. 
building. But this council went to the European uh, Electric and, and they endorsed our, our vision for a home to the jobs program. And the jobs that we are talking here are the jobs that we are creating through regeneration, both in private and public sectors. And White Mount has got a cracking, cracking success rate on a heck of a lot better than many other similar activities. Only this morning I was told by uh, a circus question in Bastion. 37% of the jobs in post circus West are, are, are taken up by local people. In fact, the target for them was to achieve 20%. Local places. 37 million dollars. And in fact, it is not just entry level jobs, but it is jobs that will still have further to progress through. I think we might particularly draw Council's attention to the one instance where I was recently out from, at um, a grant road where, where uh, Midgar are building out the green jet scheme now. And I met a person who I had met previously at the work match. Okay? Uh, opening ceremony. So there's this man who lives on this town. He saw an advert that they were looking for people to work. He didn't have a job there. He was supported by the match. He's now working just on his doorstep, saving on transport costs, and actually had a vision to progress and make a career in, in the construction industry. That is the kind of success story that work matches are not for local community. <laughs>
There is a member to this motion and it's been circulated. Can I ask Councillor Gasser to move and Councillor Fraser to second the amendment? Thank you, Madam Mayor. This council will always be on the side of parents and young people. Over the summer, I attended the A-level award ceremony uh, right in this chamber, and it was uh, really interesting to meet parents and actually talk to them about the particular parts that they have chosen for their children. I found it a really useful reminder that we should not ignore the views of parents when it comes to schools for their children. We on this side of the chamber respect parents' right to choose, and I think we need to look very carefully at what Labour have deleted from this motion. They've deleted the lines that say that this council defends the right of parents to choose what is best for, to choose the school that is best for their child, and this council pledges to uphold the right choice of schools in one's way. I find that really shocking. We, we in this council are investing in Wandsworth schools because better funded schools means a better choice of schools for parents. One way we give parents choice is by giving a genuine range of excellent schools to pick from. Lots of people talk about 92% of our schools being good, but the really amazing figure is that 38% of our schools are outstanding. That's one of the best figures in the country. Many parents in Wandsworth can choose between one outstanding school and another outstanding school. Our children get, on average, one grade higher at GCSE from the same starting point than the whole rest of the UK average results. And even as offset has got harder, we have kept pace. And does this actually matter to parents? Well, it definitely does. Nine out of ten parents know the offset rating of their local school. Labour plans to act offsets will stop parents making informed decisions about where to send their children. There are some amazing schools in Wandsworth, and one highlight of the, the last few months for me was my visit to Ronald Ross School in Putney. Ronald Ross won a national competition set by the National Farming Union. It was a really incredible achievement when you think that they're, they're part of an inner city London borough. It was, it was amazing to see the school turned into a farm for the day and lots of Wandsworth children playing with rare breed goats and donkeys. And the way they won this competition was inventing, by inventing a new piece of agricultural equipment. I think it shows that Wandsworth schools can beat all comers and um, it shows our schools leaving the country as well because that was a national competition that Ronald Cross won. Our schools do it by having excellent teachers they do it by having supporting, supportive families, and they do it by having hard-working children at those schools. They also have great governors, and I'd like to thank councillors on both sides of the chamber for performing that um, important role in Wandsworth schools. We're so committed to giving meaningful a meaningful choice of great schools to parents in Wandsworth, that we actually give inspection resource even to schools that we don't ourselves run. But the most important single thing that we do is to give schools the money that they need. This motion delivers that in spades. It continues our record of real terms increases in budgets for schools, this time with a rise of £102 for every primary pupil and £123 for every secondary school pupil. Multiplied across whole schools, that's a really big rise. The Labour amendment is so wrong that it's hard to know where to start. For starters, how can they accept the first part of our motion that there have been above inflation increases over the last few years, but then say in their amendment that there have been cuts? It makes absolutely no sense. The opposition numbers come from a union website. I've checked how much we've given our schools over the last few years, and the numbers on that site are absolutely wrong. They use a spurious rate of inflation, but they've adjusted to be too high, they deliberately confuse overall budgets with per pupil budgets. That's a really important distinction because per pupil budgets are what counts to schools and those have been rising. The facts are that there will be a 3.84% education budget increase next year with 8% for special schools. I'd like to ask the opposition to withdraw their amendment and I'd also like to ask Councillor Hogg to delete his tweets and his blog posts recently about budget cuts because they're simply wrong and they make it harder for parents to make informed decisions about
about where to send their children. I also think it's quite disrespectful to his colleague, Councillor Gatter, who has made an effort to attend our awards ceremonies in Wandsworth. She needs to be able to look parents in the eye and speak honestly to them, and the misinformation that Councillor Hogg and this Labour amendment spreads it is, is really disgraceful. The Labour amendment to dilute this motion will rightly be seen as an attempt to undermine our range of excellence. And interfere in parents' right to choose for their child. This motion is about giving children in Wandsworth the best possible start in life. And I think we should all be supporting it. Yeah.
I don't agree that getting rid of ex dedicated experienced children's centre managers yeah. or redeploying experienced specialist youth workers yeah. or ASP professionals is the best way to get children their starting right. I fear, and I hope that I'm wrong, that having fewer experienced specialist staff in the front line is not the right answer. And as I said, on to our children with social services, so that's a long way to go. We all heard the testimony of the, the young woman at uh, Corbett Parenting last week. She's had seven foster placements this year. She's had three different social workers. We are not giving her the best start of life. Our parents are waiting for ages for education, health and care plans to come through. And when they do, schools are not able to provide what their child needs. Can I ask you to write that for me? I have been interrupted. Those children are not getting the best starting life. There are children hungry going to school. In my ward, in Leafy First Down, there are children going to school hungry. hungry. And there are hundreds of them. That's what I'm saying. We are not giving them the best possible starting life. Thank well, you. I wanted to talk about choice. I thought very briefly. No, Councillor Gatton, it's really over, and I'm sorry. It really has. Well, I think it's hard to defend the lady. Sorry. Right. All right, well, I'm moving then. So, right. Councillor Sister Sessions. Um, and he's not the only one. 36 
my daughter was seven, she had a bad head injury. She had a quad brain injury and, and she really wasn't functioning in any way as she had before. It was hard for our family, very hard. And we moved from Fulham to Putnam. We thought a new start would help us get come to terms with this. Although it, actually I've got to say I could never get a quad brain injury into a long chair. <coughs> Her learning capacity and her behaviours were difficult to say the least. And I visited schools, private and state, and do you know what? Nobody wanted her. Everybody closed the door because she was going to cost them money. She was going to cost them time. And I knew through my daughters. It's funny how you're going to do it. No, actually, she's. No, it's not true. It's just about five minutes and four seconds. But come on, Council Session. I'm, I'm rushing now. I'm happy with an interview. Thank you. So thank you. No, well, no, that's it. Council right. Session, suddenly. That's it. And, and we could find no school for her. Council Session, I'm sorry. Time's up. I'll tell you all outside this meeting. You're welcome. <laughs>
For those children who want to have the most need our extra school provision, the government's cuts to youth provision is doing absolutely nothing to help them or to open up doors of opportunity for them. I'm hopeful that during my time on this council I can try and make a difference and help improve opportunities for as many young people as possible. But for this to happen, it relies on the government recognising the need to fully fund our schools and to recognise the impact that austerity has gone too far. The government had the opportunity this week to notice education and to raise the profile of it in this week's Queen's speech. There was, however, zero mention of primary, secondary, further, higher, vocational, nor technical education, whereas the Labour Party has developed a fully planned and, and put together a national education service which could be modelled. Thank you. Pleasure. Councillor Richard Jones. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, the debate thus far has focused a lot, I think, on numbers, um, but I think that's very convincing answers from the Council Member for Education and Children's Services. So I'd like to take a step back uh, and actually talk about education um, as it happens in our schools. And I think the Conservatives are actually education is one of the things that matters most to us. It matters most to us, I think, because of two core values. It goes to meritocracy and it goes to fairness. And it's only with a state education system that gives everyone the tools to compete in life that we can really have a proper meritocracy. Now, over the last nine years, Madam Mayor, there has actually been, I think, a quiet revolution in education in our country, which I think we don't actually shout about as much as we should. And having had um, policy from the national government, so of this, we've always followed in one's growth, we've always capitalised on I'd like to spend a few moments just covering some of those. So it starts with the curriculum, what our children are taught. Now, uh, this is just two examples of what I think of innovations that have really enhanced education in this country. The first is the year one college check. Now, for years and years, about the decades, we knew from educational research that phonics was the most effective, evidence-based way of teaching children literary skills. But successive governments dragged their heels and never moved to implement it in schools. And it took Michael Gove to introduce the compulsory year one phonics check. And we know it worked. As of today, 163,000 six-year-olds are now on the route to fluent literacy, more so than was when we introduced the check. We've also had a, massively, uh, a massive injection of rigour into the subject matter in English, maths, and science in our schools. And I actually saw this firsthand when I became governor of St. Face, just down the road. And one of the first things I did was that I went to a year four English class. I sat down, and the teacher wrote a sentence on the board, and then said, right, what's wrong with this sentence? And I said, don't be fine to me. <laughs> Hands flew up. Uh, yeah. Miss, it's got two subordinate clauses, it hasn't got a main clause. <laughs> yes, that's right, Jerome. I was staggered. More hands. Miss, the verb isn't conjugated properly. Miss, the noun needs to be declined. I grew up in the state system in South Wales. I went to state primary and secondary schools. This was a quality and standard of state education that I didn't recognise, such, such that it had been completely transformed from the days that I was in school. And that's, that's so it's not just the curriculum that we see in the it's also the structure of schooling. And again, I instance two examples, three schools in the academy program. We start with the free schools. The free schools were never supposed to be an answer to every educational problem in this country. I think only the Guardian ever tried to caricature it as that. But what the free school program did to you is it provided a parent and teacher-led solution to particular educational demand in certain areas. We saw that in Northcote when families and teachers came together to establish uh, the Bollingbrook Academy. We saw how the council facilitated that by authorizing the purchase of the old Bollingbrook Hospital. And I remember knocking on doors and I spoke to families who were thinking about actually going private, but didn't go private for technical education, actually sent their children to Bollingbrook. Families who actually had an older child currently in private school, but actually went to Bollingbrook because they saw the results that Bollingbrook was delivering. And they knew that the philosophy of their colleagues, their friends, the teachers were really going to introduce a top standard of education there. Yeah. Madam Mayor, when we look back at these achievements, I think to myself how bitterly opposed the Labour Party was to so many of these policies. 
I remember even a playwright secretary, a shadow secretary of sacred education, saying that free schools were nothing more than the playthings of young mummies. And I'm sure he gets a lot of them through the doors of the DNA these days. <laughs> but we learned something else in the conference a few months ago. We found that as well as being committed to reversing a lot of these policies, Labour now want to do two things. They want to abolish Oxford. They also want to abolish and expropriate the property of private schools. So this is what Labour's position comes to. They want to deny the current education of half a million children in this country who are educated in the independent sector. But at the same time, they will not allow the rollout and the implementation of policies that make our state schools the best they could be, Madam Mayor. Madam Mayor, they would condemn all our families to a standard of education that is not as high as it could be. It's not as high as the standards we've seen today. They would put ideology in the back end of the And that's their argument. Because 
The kids on the estate are being kept awake because the school next to where they live has to rent out the football pitches till late at night. And you have the gall to talk about social mobility and aspiration. Meanwhile, you want to defend one of the biggest barriers to social mobility and equality we have in this country, the very foundation of class-segregated society. And then talk about choice. What choice? Whose choice? It's not a daily choice in this education system. It's a rigged one. Education is crucial. It's the basis through which we create a loving and tolerant and creative society. Yeah. It's the building we spend the most time at outside the home. It's where we are shaped. And it's precisely because we care about the education system that we want one that is, we want one that is for everyone, that is comprehensive, that integrates communities and doesn't divide them. We should be investing in everyone's education. And yet we are literally giving tax breaks to the top and huge cuts on the shoulders of everyone else. You know, this is an issue of love for the next generation. It's an issue of fairness and justice. And this council has shown precisely where its colours, you know, land in relation to this question. And I think it's appalling that you put forward a motion on this, on this kind of political point scoring after the last 10 years that you've inflicted on the entire generation.
this was for me is what is at the absolute heart of providing the best outcome for every child and every family. You don't improve an education system by ripping something down. You improve it by rising every single level up. Yeah. Excellent education and early help are the key to breaking the cycle of deprivation. You do this through supporting our families, providing choice for our families and children, and allowing our young people to get on and secure their potentials. These values are at the heart of Conservative policy, they're at the heart of this Council's aspiration of general policy. Therefore, I commend the unamended motion to colleagues this evening, and I ask for your support in championing one to its aspiration agenda through recognition of the strength of our education system and our vision for early health. Thank you. The matter now before the Council is amendment to the motion on education aspiration, moved by Councillor Gasser and seconded by Councillor Fraser. Please indicate by a show of hands those in favour of the amendment. Those games. Not 
places um, and local hospitals, and already there are even medicine shortages in one, at each one of our local hospitals. I've spoken to a local school who said that they're facing an even worse funding shortfall than they had already, because 20 families have left um, to go to return to other EU countries, and those other families are not, which normally would have happened, are not replacing them. And that's heartbreaking to think that those families are leaving Wandsworth because of Brexit. I've spoken with business owners who are losing money already and having to spend more money on preparing for Brexit that may or may not be happening in just two weeks' time. So the government is asking us to be really very organised when they're really not very organised themselves at all. I've spoken also with local people who have said they have experienced more racism since the Brexit vote and all those three and a half years of chaos ever since then, that in their experience there's more permission given to racism on our streets, in our shops, on our public transport, in our schools and businesses. No one voted for those outcomes. I hope we would all agree in this chamber. It's been a huge mistake from the start and Wandsworth residents are paying the price for political incompetence. We need to move together as a body, one body of Wandsworth's representatives to deplore the government's headlong descent into Brexit, no matter what. To call very decisively for a people's vote, to put that back to the people. Okay. This is what the majority of Wandsworth residents want. And to do all we can to redouble our efforts to stamp out the increasing racism in our society that Brexit has unleashed.
but no more, no more than, than that. It will not influence a scintilla of any of the considerations, whether in this country or in 27 other countries. And so we need to reflect on whether this is a political indulgence or whether this is a genuine attempt to reach out to Anne and so on. So on the first one, reassuring people, I'm with her. If that was the focus of her, of her motion, I might have actually said yes. But in fact, what she's doing is as a parliamentary candidate, a prospective parliamentary candidate for public, making a market, clearly, why not? That's what you're going to want to do. You're a politician like many of us. I understand your motivation, but I do think that is a hollow motivation. And I also then say that the deal that is being talked about, and whether it'll happen or not, because I, I do not know much about it, but the deal that is talked about is one that people are having time was, let's come to an end to this matter. Let's find a way forward. Three and a bit years of this and more years of uncertainty is not what we can start. Let's get to the other side. And that is the sentiment that I have come across, not only in this part, but elsewhere, that people are saying, let us get a move on. And in fact, I also say that whether this deal comes or not, the one thing is also certain, that there is a big political issue, a big democratic issue for this country as a whole. Which of the world votes take precedent? You will ask every person in this country whether they want to stay or not, the vote came out, and what and how do you deliver that is the conundrum, which is really detaining the country for the parliament for three and a bit years. How in heaven's name is 60 people here going to shed a light on that political dilemma? How is our vote going to do anything other than, ha oh, ha, another one? So I say to Councillor Anderson, uh, motion to adjourn this council is well understood. The motivation is well understood, but it is a mistake. Therefore, I refuse, I ask my colleagues to reject. Are you content the leaders retired? Do you want to take it to the vote? Take it to the vote. Is there in favour of adjourning the council for one minute on the motion related to Brexit and other matters? Those in favour? Those against? Councillor Anderson's motion is number 2531. We will now go back to the original motion to do with education aspirations. We, as you know, the adjournment was the amendment was lost, and therefore we go back to the original motion. So, could I have show of hands those for the motion? Motion is carried 32 to 25. Questions to cabinet members will now be taken. Councillor Walker. Question number one to the cabinet member for finance, which the people in the balcony is about the climate emergency action plans.
also just like to pick up on um, the comments earlier from Councillor Grimson, and I'm very sorry he feels that way. I think he actually misunderstood um, what the leader was saying. I don't think it was intended as any kind of um, restriction on the breadth of his knowledge in this area, although it was, it was felt to be that way intentionally. And indeed, his, his expertise is very much welcome. I would go back again to what I was saying in terms of the speed with which this council is moving and the focus on the target. So there is certainly no intention for him to be excluded, and indeed that's why I approached him um, before, uh, before, uh, before our meeting uh, tonight. And we welcome, we welcome the views, as I welcome the views of many councillors approached. I mean, Councillor Dawson here has been trolling me for weeks. And, uh, <laughs> in a very welcome way. <laughs> So, so um, uh, yes, I think, uh, as, as Councillor Holder was asking, the, the skills and um, expertise for our councillors are very much helpful. Thank you for the Cabinet Member's response. I have in my hands the draft harbour management plan, one for the council. Not supposed to print it out, but no. <gasps> Well, do you know what? This piece of paper will actually go great guns into getting some action because I was delighted to find it. I was rather disappointed to see the date on it was the 4th of June 2010. So, and it still has draft on it. So judging from that, and it's really cool, there is a management plan, there is a strategy, there is a programme management of the carbon management programme. There is the council saying that they have a long-standing and independently accredited commitment to wise energy management. <coughs> and I think, isn't that where we're meant to be today, now? And isn't it such a shame that we have wasted nine years? And I'd like to ask the cabinet member that he, and I'm pleased that he's just welcomed all of us, that he agrees that it is better to be a collective success than the failure of one party. So I'm pleased to have the opportunity for my question. Well, question, 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 question. Thank you for the question. I'm very grateful, and, and in the spirit of collaboration, I'm very grateful the councillor has uh, gone into the archives to see how long we've been committed to this strategy. <laughs> <laughs> Raised a, 
at the last um, Netbox, which um, is cultural change. And, I, and it's certainly one of the parts of this that, that I know officers have been uh, working out how they can best achieve within the council so that all of our employees understand what kind of priority this is. So I was really, you know, as I've, as I've gone from officer to officer as part of my role, and, and, and in every meeting now, there, there, is a, there is a climate change part of it, even if the agenda doesn't otherwise seem to require it. And I was really pleased the, the feedback that I've had, for example, our customer services team, uh, you know, who meet in, and, and, and agree to answer the queries of our residents here on Walter High Street, had taken it upon themselves to do their own sort of personal audit of the space around them for single use plastics uh, and to dispose of them and have a different way of working. And amongst themselves, agreed to, to you know, a much better way of working. And I, I thought that was exactly what we wanted to achieve, uh, exactly what we wanted to encourage. And, um, you know, it very much is part of, of, of this objective that you set out. So, you know, thank you for the question. <coughs> Question 13 to the councillor, please. <coughs> Thank you, Councillor Cavelli, for your question. Councillors in this room on both sides have made choices to send their children to the school that they think is best for their child. I would not dream of telling a councillor in this room uh, what choice they should make for their children. And I think your position should respect the right of one of parents to do the same. Whatever you might think of private schools, 10,000 children attend them in one work, and we must defend the right of parents to make that choice. There are two big problems with Wandsworth Labour's opposition to the education of 10,000 children in our borough. The first is that it's a £66 million budget bombshell for our schools. That is money that does not exist. And the second problem is that it implies that some choices are okay and some choices are not. And if you start saying that, that's not really a choice at all. We will always be on the side of parents and young people against ideology. Educationalists 
have talked about, and I wanted to know the government member's position on this, given the fact that, can, um, for those who don't know, private schools get an 80% tax reduction, whereas local private schools have to pay 100%. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you for your question. May I say it's it's really good to be able to debate this with you. I, I think you and I may be the only two councillors that attended state schools in one way. Thank <laughs> you. 
with stock. This has been specifically asked and will be monitored. So I hope on the second time of reply that you are now satisfied. Thank you. Thank you. Supplemental, Madam Mayor. Um, in the written uh, response, it is right to point out that the leader has written to all the EU citizens in the borough and that there was a well attended event off the back of this. The cabinet member started to allude to this in her last answer, but we'll give a bit more detail around the support that not just the adult social services department, but the wider council provide to any council. I'd like to thank the council uh, for his question. The Citizens Advice Bureau will give money by the council to assist with people who have concerns about what would happen if. And those sessions have been very well attended, and a lot of people have gained a lot of comfort from that. The second status is something that is easy to get. It has been made easier and easier. And if any one of those care providers has got a problem with any EU citizen in Oxford, they know exactly where to come. Because we are here to support our EU nationals with their settled status. Councillor yeah. Morgan. Thank you. 
Yeah, four kills at Bolton. Sorry. Oh. Go on,
After the summer break, these children return to school, worse in educational health and, and in a worse developmental state. There is evidence that suggests a link between hunger and the development of antisocial behaviour in later life. Well, I was here going to say, I hope you can agree that no child should ever go hungry, but I can see your amendment that the council cannot agree to reduce hunger across Wandsworth. Shame. Absolute shame. Healthy start vouchers, which are free vouchers, free for, for families on a low income, are exchangeable for fruit, vegetables, vitamins and milk. But families in Wandsworth have missed out on over 123,000 pounds worth of healthy start vouchers, which equates to approximately 7,600 vouchers that could have been spent locally. So over the past four months, 800 vouchers every month aren't reaching eligible families in Wandsworth. So I, we need to make it easier for businesses to redeem these vouchers and promote them to families. But it is important for you to remember that this wouldn't cover every family in the borough. It is estimated by the Children's Society that six out of ten families that have been deemed to have no recourse to public funds have approached the councils for Section 17 support and have been refused. Therefore, their children receive no free school meals and have no healthy start vouchers. And a huge number of families do not ask for this support due to fears of having their ch children taken away because they are too poor. And these children are hungry every single day. If we truly believe that people of Wandsworth should start well, live well, and age well, then I ask this council on International World Food Day to commit to reduce hunger. To ensure that holiday hunger provision is provided for every school child who is going hungry with urgency, and it is half term next week. To support and raise greater awareness for healthy start vouchers, and to work to increase the number of businesses that will accept them. To support the living wage, so that parents are earning enough to buy nutritious food for themselves and families, and thus reducing the economic divide. And finally, to commit to measuring food insecurity and take real action on hunger.
Uh, it is one year spending round. The Chancellor said that the target international development will go assessment go from 9.3 billion to 9.6 billion between 2020 and 2021. So looking to the UK itself, in February this year, the government agreed to introduce an official measure of how often local families in the UK miss meals or go hungry because they can't afford to buy the food. So that measurement is coming, and like you say, it is important. I welcome this measure as it will help to see us in how to solve this issue. Neither of these are complete solutions to this issue, but they help to form part of the solution that we want to strive for. Now, bringing this back to one of us, the council is already trying to solve some of the root causes of this complex issue. In terms of reducing unemployment, we have a range of successful strategies to bring employment and opportunities into the borough. For example, work, work match, match, which in the last year helped to make 261 one of the residents finding roles, and which also helped one of the citizens to buy, buy information and buy to over 7,700 clients in 2018 and 2019. The Council has also reviewed the criteria for its discretionary social funds in September last year and took steps to widen that eligibility. This led to a 21% increase in spending from spending from the fund. Compared to two previous years, the Council continues to keep the eligibility criteria under review and will monitor the uptake of funds to ensure that this continues to reach those in need and will also remind offices and partner organisations of the existence of this, of this fund and how to sign those residents. Thank you. Thank you.
and it rises to 24% attainment gap over their peers when they leave primary. Now our schools in Wandsworth may be good, but what happens to some of our children in it is not great. We should all know these figures, and I challenge you all to remember and learn these figures. Wandsworth needs to develop policies to improve the health of the local population, and this it shows we need to work to make poor children's lives better and give them the opportunity to flourish. I can't find any examples of policies for, to ensure children are well nourished. I actually welcome one of the amendments that is that we are going to uh, Wandsworth going to work to improve the take up of healthy start. Many of the amendments are good, however, there's a couple of fundamental things missing. I'm actually disappointed, and I think you still have the opportunity to change this, that the first thing that you have done is rule out, investigate, and measure the extent of the issue. That is something that even at this late stage of the debate, I would urge you to change your minds on. One of, my, the, one of the early speakers has mentioned that this is going to come. Wandsworth could lead the way of working out with how food poverty affects those children. It's something we should be doing. We know that they are children who are in need because of our strategic needs assessment. I'm going to say this. We've got an opportunity to change what we do with our JSLA refresher this year. The motion asks for range of actions. Some are straightforward, some are requiring thought. And actually, do you know, I've been in this council now for five and a half years. I could have pretty much worked out what ones would go. And I would just say that to the party opposite. I am disappointed that you have decided not to move measure food poverty. I am not surprised. Can you vote on that? Yes. You are not committing to holiday hunger schemes. I am not surprised at other things, but I am very disappointed at that, and I urge you at this late stage to change your minds and make an amendment so that we will measure this policy. Where's your food policy? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Food is a basic human right as set out by the World Health Organisation. And today, on World Food Day, the United Nations, um, as Council Morgan reports, um, reports that over 800 million people suffer from hunger, and even more are overweight or obese. We are fortunate to live in a country where food is readily accessible compared to many places in the world. But we know food poverty is an issue here in Wandsworth, and the causes are complex and multifactorial. I want to start by echoing Council Morgan's support for the work of the Wandsworth Food Bank and add my thanks for the hard work of all those who volunteer for the service. However, we know that the majority of residents living on a low wage are not deemed to be in food poverty and therefore we need to investigate the individual reasons our residents are the ones as a Conservative, I believe that putting a sticking plaster on the issue of food poverty, um, I believe that rather than putting a sticking plaster on the issue of food poverty, we need to address the underlying issues. And the Conservative Party has been at the forefront of reforms which have helped the disadvantage. The best, the best argument for how universal credit is helping benefit our residents is the historically now with historically low level of unemployment in this country. As a public health nutritionist, I deal firsthand with the issues that limit good nutrition at every stage of life. And I know that early intervention is key. The, heart, the healthy start vouchers, which you mentioned, were introduced to provide access to valuable nutrition for those in their early years and support for parents to reinforce the need for a varied diet. It is of concern that whether in school or not, take up of the vouchers nationally is only 66%, with 3 out of 10 children or families not, benefit, not benefiting from the resource. Improving take up for our residents in Wandsworth must be a key goal. Secondly, childhood obesity is one of the biggest health problems this country faces. And as you rightly point out, Councillor Pritchard, children are highly likely to go on to become overweight adults at risk of cancer, heart disease, type 2 diabetes, the list goes on. The burden is being felt the hardest 
in most deprived areas, with children growing up in low-income households more than twice as likely to be obese than those living in higher-income households. From my clinical experience in the NHS, I understand the challenges of achieving a healthy diet for those living in deprivation. Lack of basic cooking facilities, as you say, cuts in which lack of time, creating a greater reliance on takeaway food, which tends to be higher, as you say, in um, sugar, fat and salt, and limited access to fruit and vegetables. I want to commend the great work done by our schools in Wandsworth to promote healthy meals, both within the curriculum and as part of their work to engage with families and the wider community. One great example of this is Westbridge Primary Academy in Battersea, which offers a cooking club after school, uh, sorry, a cooking club after school, which is loved by children of all ages and it helps develop their wider learning along with key life skills. We need to have more of these in Wandsworth. We need to work together locally in Wandsworth to create an environment which encourages healthy behaviours in order to achieve the national ambition to halve childhood obesity by 2030. I am therefore pleased to see this as a key priority in the recently launched Wandsworth Local Health and Care Plan. Finally, um, as this is Malnutrition Awareness Week, which you might not be aware of, I want to raise this neglected public health problem. This affects over 10% over of people over the age of 65. The causes, again, are multifactorial. The causes are both social and clinical, and, in, and also include decreased mobility and social isolation. I'm therefore delighted that Wandsworth has committed to support and develop initiatives to combat isolation. In summary, we need to ensure that we take a holistic approach to managing the causes of poor diet in this borough. And I'm pleased that we are going to investigate and look further into the extent of the issue so we can provide an evidence-based approach to lift our families out of food poverty.
of uh, violent crime and high crime in particular and as it affects young people um, and the devastating consequences of it uh, uh, to anyone uh, affected. Uh, the issue of course is, is complex and I'll come on to that uh, but the Prime Minister's announcement of funding for 20,000 extra police across the nation uh, is extremely welcome and will be a substantial number in London and of course uh, as the largest um, borough command unit, the South West Borough Command Unit, um, which uh, is the largest part, we'll, we'll be seeing our police resourcing and visibility matters. And we're reminded of that uh, right now because of the uh, very high abstraction rates to, uh, to taking our police officers away to events in central London, which many of us have noticed. Uh, it, really does, uh, it really does matter. So it was especially good to hear last night in the Safe and Neighbourhood Board, uh, which I was pleased to see so many colleagues at, um, that uh, the first cohort of some 1,300 uh, of those extra police were already being recruited, so it's happening. Uh, and this comes too after the announcement uh, by the Home Secretary in March of uh, £100 million pounds for serious violence units, and in London, uh, violence reduction unit funded uh, with uh, central government money uh, to the tune of £7 million pounds, uh, to tackle the root causes of serious violence, which of course includes knife crime. Um, as I say, police numbers and visibility are extremely important. They deter violence, they protect the public, and they provide reassurance. And uh, tackling and deterring serious violence is a priority for not just the Met, but this borough as well. We've always made that very, very clear. And many tactics, as we heard last night, targeted raids, visual patrols, the use of tasers, stop and search, they all have their place, however controversial they may sometimes be. Uh, reductions, again, we heard last night, reductions in violent crime, uh, across our borough are very welcome, uh, and I was pleased to see the Labour amendment. There is some recognition uh, that uh, knife crime has declined by 19% in the borough in the last year. Um, that, of course, is welcome. It's better than many boroughs. We have a better record than, uh, than other uh, inner London boroughs. But that, of course, will be absolutely no consolation for anyone who's been affected by serious violence. And, and knife crime in particular, no consolation whatsoever. Um, greater law enforcement is essential, but it will not in turn reduce serious youth violence. Uh, we must continue to focus on early intervention and prevention, and it's vital to understand the longer term causes and tackle them. The key element we all know we recognise is gang membership, drug dealing along county lines, inter gang rivalry criminal exploitation of young people by organised gangs and understanding how that drug dealing is a driver of violence and the risks of young people becoming victims, perpetrators or both. Countering this demands close partnership working, uh, cooperation across all agencies working with young people. It's something I've been driving uh, in recent months across the council uh, and uh, it's remarkable just about every department has some involvement uh, on that dimension and that, that work is, uh, is going on vigorously now. Glasgow has shown how uh, all of these relationships exist and much of what has been done in pioneering way in Glasgow is now being emulated in the borough and it's probably at least two years now since I had detailed discussions with Deputy Mayor Sophie Linden on exactly this point. Uh, known as the public health approach, the idea that uh, the violent crime and night crime is a disease can be uh, tackled as such. Um, but it's a tragic fact that many of those involved in youth violence have experienced negative life events much earlier in their lives, uh, often to small children. And so that's why we're very, very focused on coordinating efforts across all of those agencies, uh, because we think it's uh, one of the key approaches. Um, actions in the plan that we have developed are grouped into themes, uh, governance, targeting lawbreakers, keeping deadly weapons off the streets, tackling the accessibility of knives, protecting and educating our young people, supporting victims and ensuring they're at the heart of our holistic response and offering ways out of crime. And our plan has been very, uh, very much welcomed by our independent review. It's a very strong, clearly led, uh, robust, uh, robust uh, um, reaction to the problem. Um, we've already had, uh, I, I see that uh, a long time, um, we've already heard uh, this evening the importance of education and creating that sense Cook, of can you it, uh, yeah. creating that sense of aspiration and new possibilities rather than taking a criminal path. And so that is something with all of our partners, of whom there are very many in the borough, and we're very lucky in that respect, but we seek to encourage uh, and uh, I just quickly mention work that base uh, and many of the others too. Thank you very much.
Despite what Count uh, Cook says, I do find this motion profoundly depressing. I believe that we will only tackle crime, and particularly knife of our island crime, if the government, the mayor, and local councils work together with community groups to fundamentally change the culture and the causes of the behaviour. The offer on behalf of the Labour group to work collaboratively with the majority party was and remains genuine. Instead, this motion, as opposed to what Councillor Cook talked about, is nothing more than a cheap stunt to score points using the victims of crime and their families and friends as a political football. It is not helpful. I do, however, find it disingenuous that the party opposite is now lauding the Prime Minister's Council of 20,000 extra police officers. Even if you are fool enough to believe the most distrusted Prime Minister this country has had in living memory and beyond, this is less than the number of police officer posts that have been lost since 2010 as a result of the government's own policy. We should remember Theresa May when Home Secretary telling the police delegation that there was no link between the crime rate and the number of police officers. This is the same government that Boris Johnson was a member of. In London, the Metropolitan Police Command from the government has fallen by 700 million since 2011, resulting in a reduction of 3,000 officers. London taxpayers now fund 23% of the Met Police budget, as opposed to 18% in 2010. Sadiq has put an extra 110 million into Metropolitan Police funding, including 49 million pounds, with special emphasis on addressing crime. Madam Mayor, I also find it depressing that neither this motion nor the one on education aspiration address the causes of crime. In London, councils have had to slash 22 million from youth services since 2011, closing 30 youth centres with at least 12,700 places. Yesterday it was reported that there has been a substantial increase in hate crime by 10%, so 100,000 cases, with race hate crimes representing staggering 70% of the total, almost certainly a part consequence of the government's own place of policies on Brexit and on immigration. And the Tory government's high harm incidents across the entire country, including offences involving knives and firearms, are on the rise. In the year ending in March 2018, police recorded a 16% increase in offences involving a knife or sharp instrument, totaling over 14,000 offences the highest number since 2011. In the same period, serious firearm offences increased significantly, and the number of homicides recorded by the police showed a fourth consecutive rise, increasing by 12%. The highest increase in the rate of life and anywhere in the country is in Tory case, with a staggering 140% increase. But it's not just in the speech. Francis Crook, CEO of the Howard League for Penal Reform, said of the government's proposals for allegedly cracking down on crime, quote, this is not a sensible evidence-based policy. It is the politics of the lynch mob. But many of the proposals are not new, are an unnecessary duplication of existing judicial powers, as the Prison Reform Trust has pointed out. And Richard Atkins, the chair of the Barnes Bar Council, nearest thing to a trade union representative from some of the people, obvious, which represents barristers in England and Wales, said that, quote, for the last decade, the Ministry of Justice has been in dire need of rescue as he's buckled under the strain of greater budget cuts than any other Whitehall department. In conclusion, I can't help but agreeing with Chris Dore QC, a criminal and fraud expert who tweeted, 
Make no mistake, the current Tory approach to crime and punishment is just dangerous populist electioneering. This motion is nothing more, nothing less than a complete repudiation of Tory government policy on crime Thank you. and police numbers since 2010. Thank you. It is an omission of complete abject Thank failure you, without Henderson. insight or courage to correct past Council. mistakes. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Councillor Calland. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, colleagues, I, I'm actually very proud to support this motion. Conservatives are sometimes called the party of law and order, which I think makes it sound a little bit like a 90s TV drama. But I actually want to talk this evening a little bit about what I think that really means and about why that really matters uh, when we talk about rates of rising rates of violent crime. This motion talks about the devastation that families feel when violent crime touches their lives. Over the last year, I have actually very sadly lost two members of my own family very suddenly and through what some people sometimes euphemistically called misadventure. So I have first-hand knowledge that losing somebody suddenly and the knowledge that they have died too young and needlessly is one that haunts you and encourages you to seek to find ways to ensure that that doesn't happen to any other family ever again. This is why this motion matters. And this is what it means for us in London. What it means is, as Councillor Cook touched upon, it means an extra 1,369 police on the streets. This is in the first wave of the 20,000 officers promised by central government. And that's men and women on the streets, on the force, starting now. What it means for all the people, for all of our residents, who I've spoken to many of across our borough, is that they won't be as worried. I talk to people every week, and they are worried about antisocial behaviour on their estate. They are worried about the rise that they read about in the newspaper of violent crime, and they're worried about walking home by themselves at night. They want to see more officers on them in their neighbourhoods, and they want to see them with the powers they need in order to protect them and to cut crime. This is what we're doing. This is why we are making it simpler for the police to use emergency stop and search powers to take those knives off of our streets. In fact, we will, we will have empowered more than 8,000 officers to authorise stop and search powers. It means that there are going to be new proposals for victims to see that they receive the support that they need and the justice that they deserve, including changes to our parole system. What it means is that the extremely important domestic abuse bill will continue to be debated in this term of parliament. What it means is that, quite simply, our party delivers on crime in a way I'm afraid the others just don't. Labour talk about an additional 10,000 police, half the amount that we are already delivering. The Lib Dems want to stop stop and search, and they want to stop... Are you finished? Well, Councillor I'm not Gibbon. taking any interruptions, Councillor. so you can be. Councillor Gibbon, allow Councillor Callan to continue, please. Thank you, Madam Mayor. The Lib Dems want to reduce our stop and search, and they want to end mandatory sentences for carrying a knife and for acid attacks. They also want to decriminalise cannabis and put police in our secondary schools. Here in London, I think our residents may rightly ask why it is that Sadiq Khan waited for central government to bail him out, instead of cutting waste already there in City Hall to put more cops on our streets. Scotland Yard, for example, pays twice as much as Derbyshire Force for their helmets and eight times as much as other forces just to get a laptop forensically analysed. As usual, labour mismanagement and always blamed on somebody else. As what we hear often, very often in fact, from the Mayor, from Labour MPs and I'm sure from the other side of this chamber, is that the police simply don't have the resources they need to keep London safe. Well I can tell you that that is simply not true. The Met budget increased year on year and in 2018-19 by 110 million. That comes from about 49 million from government changes to council tax and 60 million thanks to higher than predicted business rates which come largely from Conservative led authorities. What they don't want to admit is that any cuts to the budget happened under Boris while violent crime rates went down and that, in fact, violent crime rates and budgets have both gone up under the current London mayor. 
We all know that more police and more powers isn't the only solution to this. Councillor Cook talked about it a lot in his speech earlier. We need to look at the public health approaches like Glasgow and the council is and will continue to work tirelessly to tackle the underlying causes of this issue to understand the longer term influences and to engage with all of our partners on this. And we don't just do this because we are the party for law and order. We do this because actually it's the only way that we can stop those families feeling the devastating effects of losing somebody too young and without any cause. Thank you, Councillor Callan. Councillor Cooper? Uh, thank you very much, Councillor Cooper. Sorry, Madam <laughs> Mayor. Um, this is a really serious motion discussing one of the most important issues currently facing our city. And I really appreciated the comments from Councillor Cook, who I thought made a dignified and very welcome contribution in this council chamber. Um, unfortunately, Councillor Calland um, has uh, stood up and told a series of lies and unfortunately has tried to turn this, tried to turn this into no more than a political football. And I think, unfortunately, I was rather hoping, I was rather hoping that you might accept our amendment, which took out the part of the motion where you seem to want to just say that everything is down to the current mayor, which is clearly a nonsense because even the police federation um, and the Metropolitan Police themselves are making it quite clear that that is not the case. Um, the cuts since 2010 have totaled £850 million. And we know that the numbers of the police were only kept up in the city because we had the Olympics coming in 2012. So it was rather convenient for the previous mayor um, that that happened. But as soon as the Olympics had gone, the bearing down on the budget of the Mayor of London, which I think rather annoyed him, um, saw violent crimes start to rise from 2014, which is why I'm saying Councillor Calland is deliberately misleading everybody in this, um, in this chamber. Now, unless you're suffering from absolute memory loss... Point of personal you'll, information. You'll remember the Prime Minister struggling with cuts to his police budgets when he was the Mayor of London. He closed police stations all over London. He bought water cannon, Madam water, Mayor, cannon, water, water cannon, nation. which he then couldn't use because the Home Secretary, again, not much yeah. of a yeah. friend of his, yeah. Yeah. Um, to try and make, out for ha make up for having fewer police on the street. He moved from the Safer Neighbourhood team system of one sergeant, two PCs and three PCSOs, stripping away our frontline police uh. all over London. So you no wonder violent crime started to go up. I think you don't have to allow Councillor Callan no to... No wonder put he fell out. Council I'm not Cooper. prepared to be interrupted in the middle of my speech, Madam Mayor. She can do it again. No wonder, no wonder personal he fell out with David Cameron, George Osborne and Home Secretary I think Councillor Cooper, Councillor Callan like, wants personal she? explanation. Yes, she does. Because you have accused um, her... I hope you've stopped the clock, Madam Mayor. We will stop the clock. Thank you very much. Just to say, I've now twice been accused by Councillor Cooper of lying to this chamber, and I'm very happy to share my figures with her after this meeting to show that I'm not. Yeah. Very dignified, Councillor Calland. Councillor Cooper. Well, I'm sure you'd like to share them with the Police Federation and also with the Metropolitan Police Force and everyone else who has actually seen the figures that show crime rising since 2014. Extra resources are, of course, extremely welcome. Nobody denies that restoring the cuts that have been made since 2010 is a really important thing for us. But it's just not enough to talk about 20,000 police, of which only 6,000 will be recruited by 2022, and 1,369 is not enough um, to assist us in the short term, as we all know. But don't take my word for all of this. It's Cressida Dick who's been calling for at least 6,000 new police officers um, on, on the streets. And one of the problems inherited by the current mayor is not just that he had, uh, there had been these massive budget cuts from 2010 onwards. It was also that the previous mayor, yes, uh, yeah, the, Boris Johnson, had not been putting up the mayoral precept. And that's where the £110 million has come. Look, we need more assistance in London if there's a big
big demonstration. People are going to come here and make it because that's where the Houses of Parliament are. That's where Extinction Rebellion will come. That's where taxi drivers will come. That We've got Buckingham Palace to protect. We are a national and international capital city. We have challenges that we face in London that other police forces around the country simply do not. The Home Office's own figures show that the national and international capital city grant that we should be getting, we are £110 million short on that grant alone. So whilst this is a welcome addition and extra police is helpful, it is not going to make up for all of that money that has been stripped away. And that, of course, sits alongside the cuts, the massive cuts that have been made to council budgets across London. Councillor Caddy was talking about the problems with homelessness growing again since 2010. We know that the cuts have been massive to all of our budgets, and that includes budgets for diverting children away from crime, meaningful activities. We know that it is not just about what you do with the police when you get to the sharp end, it's also diverting people, as Councillor Cook went into in eloquent detail. And unless we are prepared to agree that more money comes to councils as well to enable us to divert children Council away Cooper. from crime, then we are going to fail. I hope you accept our amendment and take out the politics from this motion. I Thank you, Councillor Cooper. <laughs> Standing Order 32. Yes. Yes. Sorry. Um, thank you. Given the lateness of the hour, Madam Mayor, I move that we uh, terminate the remainder of business under the terms of Standing Order 32. Is that seconded? Is that seconded? seconded. Thank you. Agreed. 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 Thank you. No. no. <laughs> vote. Those in four. Okay, so we've got a vote then. Vote. Those in favour of the guillotine. Those in favour of the guillotine. Against? Carried 32.25. The, the, amendment. the amendment will go back to the motion. The amend we'll start with the amendment. Those in favour of the amendment? Those against? Okay, so that's uh, lost twenty three thirty one. Lost twenty three thirty one. So the same numbers. So I'll put the original motion. Same numbers. Thank you. Yeah. 2331. So it's now the on a fair deal no, it isn't. If we've dropped it, we've got the guillotine. So uh, we need to move the motion. Councillor White to move it. The meeting will now consider the motion on a fair deal for renters. Can I ask Councillor White to move and Councillor Allen to second the motion? So you're not going to debate it, you're just going to move it. Just move, just move, just move and second. Just move and second. I didn't think we get the act as well, so just move and second. Agreed? Agreed. Councillor White? Agreed. Okay. Councillor Island? The amendment. The amendment. Councillor, Councillor Govindia and Councillor Locker? Seconded. Thank okay. you. Those in favour of the amendment? Those in favour of the amendment? Those against? Those against? Those against? Those against? That's carried 20, 32, Carried 32, 24. Is the uh, substantive motion the same numbers? Is the, same, is the substantive motion the same numbers? 
Thank you. We now turn to Executive Report Number 2, and I will ask Councillor Mrs Hampton to deal with Paragraph 1 from the report. Paragraph 1. Thank you. Housing Regeneration OSC, Councillor Caddy. Paragraphs 2 and 3 for information. Paragraph 2 or 3. You're 4, 2, but against 3. Agreed. Yes, so Paragraph 2 is agreed. Paragraph sorry, 3. Mr Mayor, sorry, I, I wish to vote against Paragraph 2. Pardon? Madam Mayor, I, I wish to vote against paragraph two. Against so paragraph two. Those Thank you. So those, so those in favour of paragraph two. Sorry, Councillor Grimston. Those against? Fifty-four, four, one against. Sorry about that, Councillor Grimston. Uh, paragraph, paragraph three. Paragraph three. I know there's so, so, uh, those in favour. Those in favour of paragraph three. Those against? Okay. That's carried 32-24. Carried 32-24. Okay. Um, Strategic Planning and Transportation OSC, Councillor Ellis. Uh, Madam Mayor, paragraphs 4, 5 and 6 are for information. Thank you. Education Children's Services OSC, Councillor Sweet. Paragraph 7 for information. Paragraph 8 for information. Paragraph 9 for information. Thank you. Finance and Corporate Resources, OSC, Councillor O'Brien. Paragraphs 10 and 11 for information, please. Thank you. Community Services and Open Spaces, OSC, Councillor Mrs. Sutters. Councillor, uh, paragraph 12 for information. Reference up. So the reference up has got to be moved. So who's going to move it? Councillor Walker. Councillor Walker to move. Walker to move. Councillor Walker to move it. Are you going to let me speak? No. 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 Just formally <laughs> move. The mayor's going to let me speak. <laughs> yeah, that doesn't matter. Can I speak? Can I talk no, about it? No, no speeches. Just move okay, it. Okay, so we're opposing this. Councillor Stock. Councillor Stock, will you second? Will you second? second? Just say second. Thank you. Okay, those in favour of the amendment. Those in favour of the amendment. The amendment. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five. Those against? Against. Paragraph twelve for Okay, that's lost 25 31. Lost 25 31. Yeah. So, can I put the original motion that paragraph 12 be received as information? Is that agreed? It's agreed. agreed. Thank you. Same numbers. Same, same, same numbers as before, yes. Yeah. Planning apps committee report number three, Councillor Humphreys. Thank you. Joint Staffing Committee Report Number Four, Councillor Govindia. Thank you. Audit Committee Report Number Five, Councillor Salia. Paragraphs for information. Thank you. Joint Pensions Committee Report Number Six, Councillor Senior. Thank you. Health and Wellbeing Board, Councillor Mrs Hampton. Paragraphs 1, 2, 3 and 4. Thank you. General Purposes Committee, uh, Councillor Dawson. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Paragraph 1 for information. Thank you. Item 18 is report of the Chief Executive on further proposed changes to committee memberships. Paper number 19, 299. In addition... 
In addition, the council is also being asked to approve the appointment of Councillor McKinney in place of Councillor Ambash on the Education and Children's Services OSC. All those recommendations, including the amendment, agreed. Thank you. Thank you, councillors. That concludes the business for the evening. Thank you. Your fan club's all you in. There weren't my fan club, I just got them in. Oops.